everyone welcome uh, to another turf talk here at the pro turf talks discord server um jay Laveau, i'm one of the admins here joined today by the notorious and sort of an urban legend of mr ray ito the green duck of hawaii <laughs> how are you sir i am good all right been planning this for a while i've been trying to get you here and speak a little bit on pgrs and you know their their practical uses in turf maybe touch on some things that they're used on outside of the turf setting i know i have a we have a lot of, of people in here asking about you know what the shape what they should be using how often do they apply it the rates and stuff like that i mean this is quite a big subject to try to cram into a small conversation but um i thought maybe we could just kind of do our best and give a general understanding or try to help people understand pgrs and what they do i want to just touch on what uh plant growth regulars are i guess just a general uh definition or uh your understanding of them, if you will? My definition of a plant growth regulator is a substance outside of a fertilizer that causes a plant to either grow and develop more quickly or else conversely, more relevant to what we're talking about, is it causes that growth and development to either stop or slow down. You know, that's this is like a pretty wide category of... Uh, products and materials out on the market is that there are materials that will either promote growth and then there's the products that we're more familiar with that actually slow growth down a little. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my actual understanding of, you know, what a plant growth regulator is. And okay. they can actually work in opposition or contradiction of each other as, uh, you know, like, uh, Spin and I kind of talked about in another, uh, at another venue. You know, okay. They can be contradictory. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, there's, uh, I mean, you're manipulating the growth of the plant with uh, whatever it is that you're trying to use. Right, right. What are, um, I mean, there's various types. I mean, you don't have to touch too much on like type one, type two, but maybe like um, active ingredients and trade names that um, exist out there. Well, I'm familiar with at least uh, four commonly used PGRs in the uh, turf grass market uh, that I consider actual PGRs. There's another type class of PGRs that are not used on fine turf because they're actually more like herbicides that are applied at low rate. And, you know, I don't think any of us here would want to entertain applying something that is basically a herbicide or a, a turf grass killer. So to start, the most famous, you know, actual PGR is Trinexapac Ethyl. And that, you know, goes by Primo, Podium, Tenex, uh, Promaxis. I mean, there's like, you know, all kinds of uh, manufacturers putting out uh you know, Trinexapac Essel as an off-patent uh, formulation. And thank goodness for that, because I still remember my first bottle of uh, Primo that I bought uh, back in the 1990s that costed about $200. <laughs> then oh, yeah. Some, uh, some of those, uh, yeah, they can yeah. be very expensive. Go ahead. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, next up is Paclobutrazol. And that is normally sold as either... Paclo or trim it by Syngenta, and that's another one that is most commonly used uh, in a golf setting because it preferentially regulates poa annua more so than the cool season grasses that it's normally applied to. And then, similar to Paclobutrazol, but then very different in terms of the way it behaves, is Fleurprimidol. And unfortunately, Fleurprimidol does not have any off-patent, uh, you know, products out there. So it's rather expensive, but I find that it has a lot of good uses for warm season turf. And then lastly, we got a new or prohexadione calcium. And my understanding is, is that up until now, a new or prohexadione did not have an off-patent product uh, available to the turf market, but I have been hearing about a product that is off patent and it comes at a very nice off patent price. Aldo, <laughs> yeah, it's a generic new, is that right? Yes, 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 absolutely. 
the uh i mean yeah and then so the, another thing too is questions are usually when somebody's uh you know they hear it and maybe they uh they want to give it a shot you know they say oh man i I, I, I would love to cut my grass once a week or, you know, twice a week, whatever. Uh, let's mm -hmm. say, you know, they just happen to uh, be in their peak of their season and their, their uh, grass is just really taking off, right? Um, they're going to ask you, like, okay, so, you know, what should I use? Like, you know, what's the name of the product that I should use, you know? And then so you've said it yourself, you know, there's things like, um, you know, the active ingredients, of course, but of course you have Teenex, you have things like uh, a new or Cutlass or, you know, you hear about Legacy as well and then that little... Uh, version of it called edgeless that's a little bit more uh, homeowner friendly right um yes. so yeah. so so the the applications like um for example let's say somebody in a cool season environment is interested in in putting their lawn under regulation with something that they can use and then and then after that maybe you want to touch on the warm season side okay believe it or not when somebody comes to me and they're thinking about regulating their cool season turf i actually recommend that they really explore a new rather than Trinexapac Essel, especially if they're working with turf type tall fescue or a cool season blend containing turf type tall fescue. And there's several reasons for it. Reason number one is that with a new, the effect of that tends to plateau at a point where the turf grass is not overregulated to the point of it causing either damage or decline of the turf. Uh, a new tends to be rather soft on turf grass. And point number two about a new is that it tends to put grasses, especially cool season grasses, into regulation and the regulation happens and the regulation is a little bit more prolonged in many cases versus trinexapac yet at the same time the rebound effect coming out of regulation from something like a new is not like trinexapac where once your turf grass has completely metabolized that pgr you will see rebound or surge growth and that surge growth can either work for you or against you depending on you know what your turf grass management goals are yeah, so yeah. you were saying a new and what was the other one? You say Tnex? Yeah, Trinexapac. But Trinexapac is something that I've never had the chance to apply Trinexapac to turf type tall fescue, but I've heard of situations from other people where it did not do do very well or work very well for them because it overregulated the turf and adverse effects and consequences occurred as a result of that overregulation. I, I know um I know I have know some people here on the webs that you know they have um some uh, KBG or some perennial rye in uh, in their lawns and um I guess they they have preferences to where you know what some of them do some don't I know um I know of somebody who has a who has a, a perennial ryegrass mono stand um mm -hmm. I think you know who I'm talking about and uh, he uh, happens to not have a great experience with something like Tnex he says that um that he hates it for some reason. Are, are some grasses more prone to certain AIs? They are, actually. And this is, this is where it's a matter of the AI rate and also environmental conditions when they're putting the turf grass under regulation. For example, I would tread very cautiously if I were going to put a cool season grass on trinexapac during the summer for example i think real hard about that because summer due to the heat and you know the overall stressful growing conditions actually is the time of the year when the grass probably is more susceptible to damage from being overregulated and then you yeah combine that's already that, a stressful period and right you no know. Yeah. And then you combine that regulation from the trinexapac with, for example, some of the fungicides that people will have to use to prevent or treat diseases in their cool season grass that's also suffering from excessive you know, moisture and humidity, then it just, uh, I don't see it ending well for some people because they're already 
under rather strong and prolonged regulation from their fungicide, and then they add trinexapac on top of that, and that can be a case of way too much. Shut down for too long. Or, yeah, well, I understand. They're actually shut down too hard. It's right. not a matter of how long. It's, you know, how much the growth is suppressed. Because Aldo, and, you know, to the listeners out there, my sign that a lawn or a turf area is overregulated is when somebody walking from their front door to their mailbox leaves a track to their, through their lawn, for example. That tells me that they are way overregulated. Okay. Okay. Hey, I mean, right. if, if a lawn reacts negatively to even light foot traffic, that's your sign that you're overregulated. Okay, good to know. Yeah. On um, on 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 the contrary, here on on the warm season side, you know, what are like I, I myself, I'm I'm in the south in Southern California, and um, I have Bermuda grass, and mm. I uh. I, like to someone like me, I'm sorry. Uh, to somebody like me in, in the south with cool, with warm season with like soysia or in Augustine or other Bermuda cultivars, maybe even centipede, it's something that we could potentially look at and maybe have work or have better effect on the grass than on the cool season side. Well, on the on the warm season side, uh, my recommendation is uh, because we have warmer temperatures, uh, we have to consider. For example, two other factors. Factor number one is how quickly is our PGR able to put the grass in regulation? Number two, how strongly the grass is going to be regulated? And number three, how long that regulation is going to last? Because in hot temperatures, like in the south, you know, California, and Hawaii even, what we have to think about is doses of something like, say, Trinexapac that provide adequate regulation are, without overregulating, are literally going to be no longer effective in as little as 14 days. So, for example, in the South and Hawaii and California, I actually recommend that somebody consider for example, using trinexapac to induce regulation, and then they maintain that regulation with a little bit of fluoroprimidol, also known as cutlass. And what the cutlass does is that's an example of a PGR that will last a lot longer versus trinexapac by itself, because uh, on the product labeling, it says quite clearly. App reapplication intervals can be anywhere from three to six weeks, whereas the labeling for the Trinexapac states up to a month, but I know we're going to get into this next topic pretty soon. In real life, your period of effective and reasonable regulation can be as short as 14 days. <laughs> right, yeah, and that has to do with the... Uh... We all know it is the growing degree day, right? <clears throat> right, right. As a matter of fact, right, we have um, we have a get, uh, someone, an audience member, uh, who you may be familiar with. We have uh, Bill Cruiser. I hope I'm saying the last name correctly. Bill Cruiser. Oh, Doctor B- Doctor Bill Cruiser. Yes, Doctor Bill Cruiser. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for the correction. Um, I'm actually going to invite him to speak if he'd like to join and and maybe speak a little bit on the uh, growing degree days and you know how they how we have we should consider them, especially when we start applying plant growth regulators to the yard and you know um it, it's it's quite a uh man i don't want to say a difficult subject to understand it's just it, it varies it varies on you know your own you know your weather where you live and you know your growing season really and i think a lot of factors into consideration so uh bill welcome um happy to have you here sir and it was a nice surprise for you to join us thanks yeah no sorry i had the notification and i was like hey i can can chime in here if you're interested in listening to me so uh no, I, th- I thought radio did a great job of starting the, the topic. And, uh, yeah, I think growing degree days, you know, we've been doing them now for, oh, shoot, 13 years. Uh, and so it's it's been something that we've been testing and, and really actively doing in golf turf. Um, but now we're getting a lot of interest in, in the kind of the lawn market, and that's cool. You know, I wish I was putting down PGRs on my lawn. Uh, too lazy, <laughs> I think. 
Um, but, you know, I think we're, we're working now because there's this interest in in lawn care to, to build better models for lawns and for rough, you know, tall fescue, uh, bluegrass. And so that's one of the active areas for my research uh, this summer is helping build better models for, for homeowners. Uh, Bill, what have, what have your experiences been so far with using PGRs on lawn height, turf type, tall fescue and lawn height, bluegrass? What have, what have you been seeing? Because, uh, so far, I've only heard about, uh, you know, people's experiences on the various forums where it didn't work out very well for them or else, uh, you know, it's just that some, it didn't happen and, in, in a way that was a very positive experience. Yeah, I think, so actually, one of the first years we started the research, um, we were me messing around with, uh, there was a granular form of next pack ethyl called governor mm -hmm. uh and so we were applying that and then we did primo and then we had non-treated control and, you know i think you had that non-treated control so even your homeowners out there um it, it would really be who you to just put like a little you know two by two piece of paper or cardboard or wood down and when you spray and just have that area so that you can kind of make sure that what you're seeing as a result of the growth regulator and not maybe some other kind of stress it's something we tell golf course superintendents to do all the time. But we did apply Trinx back ethyl across this, this different lawn plot, University of Wisconsin, when I was a master's student. And we did it on a couple different bluegrasses. One's a lower mow bluegrass, newer variety. One was an older one. And then it was fine fescue, tall fescue, and perennial ryegrass. So six different kind of lawn types. <laughs> Then we saw the standard about 50% reduction at the rates that were labeled for those products. And so I think the thing, the question I get from superintendents that I'm sure lawn, care, lawn people are having the same issue with is like, how much do I need? Do I need 50% suppression? Do I need 20%? Do I need 80%? Is more better? And what we're kind of finding uh, from our research, uh, especially the last couple of years, is that Yes, it's cool to shut your growth rate down, but if you go too slow, then we start having these other problems. So what I say for cool season growers is if you're mowing at three inches, which I'm sure a lot of lawn enthusiasts are less than that, but let's just keep the, the three inch analogy in our head. You know, we should be needing to mow about weekly to sustain one third rule. And if we start seeing reductions in our growth rates that are really less than that, um, so you're maybe going like every two weeks, like that's all sounds great, but from a plant health and performance perspective, that plant, those leaves can't recover from heat stress. You know, if you're over mowing, what we see a lot of times too is the grass is growing so slow, but if you keep mowing at the same frequency, you actually beat up the tips of the leaves and you get this browning effect. So it looks green if you dig down but the, if you look at it from like, you know, the street, it's kind of like this brown hue over the top. So that's kind of the thing you're trying to balance when you're using growth regulators is you use a higher rate, gives you more suppression. But if you have too much suppression, then that can be problematic. So the thing that I do on my golf course plots and research plots is I like never use the same rates. I'm always adjusting based on how hard the grass is pushing to grow. Uh, we just left June in Nebraska. It was growing real slow, real hot, real dry. Uh, and also, as the days are getting longer, it makes the grass grow slower. Um, but then what we see is after that summer uh, solstice, the grass kind of just bolts on the ground. So on my golf greens today, I just did a really, really high rate of trim, uh, a new uh, and trim it oh, uh, to try to shut that growth rate down. So I'm being flexible with what I'm observing in my growth rate. That kind of sounds like what I need to do on all of the zoysia grass turf that I maintain <laughs> is where in the warm months out of the year, I'm running fairly high rates of cutlass with a lower rate of trinexapac. And the reason why I'm doing that is because with zoysia, at least, the cutlass provides prolonged regulation but the zoysia is not overregulated to the point where, like you say, it can't recover from injury. Whereas with the trinexapac, trinexapac doesn't last very long in the in the heat because I'm burning through the you know growing degree days in 14 days or less. But 
problem with Trinexapac is that it will overregulate. And so conversely, because I have a 12 months growing season where I'm at, what I will do is in the winter months, I'll switch from more cutlass to a lot less cutlass and then just go to a new and trinexapac on the zoetia and that provides acceptable regulation you know on zoetia kept at approximately a half an inch yeah i think that's that's the thing that i'm, I'm talking about you know with, with uh, research is uh is just you know focusing uh on the lawn side better honestly our, our is we just we need better models for those lawn height grasses, both cool and warm season. Mm-hmm. Again, most of them have been applied and developed for uh, fairway and green height turf, and so you know we're actively trying to pursue that because a lot of the PGRs, if used at the rates that we can understand, you might be able to use any one of those ingredients and get more or less the same result. Like for example, on cool season potting greens, like the, the, the classic example is people say, "Well, trim is too hard on the grass." Well, it is. If you wanted that same level of growth suppression out of Primo, you would have to be at like a four to six X over rate, right? So that's the problem. Um, so they're, they're not apples to apples. It's not like fungicides, they're going to tell you a rate that's going to control a disease, right? That's what, but in a growth regulator, when it comes to labeling these products, it's kind of up to the manufacturer to figure out like, well, what's the rate we think is appropriate for a grain, minimizing risk for maybe, you know, problems with the, the, the look of the, the lawn or the fairway or whatever area you're trying to label. That's why on those labels, they'll say like the label rate for a roadside or for a fence line could be 10x what a putting green is. It's purely because they're just trying to figure out what's reasonable from a risk perspective for them and, and all those different things are trying to balance. Exactly, exactly. It's uh, It all is uh, very, what I'm going to say, contextual in that the response you get from a PGR also depends on all of the other cultural practices because what, for example, what I do is I'm basically dancing a very, uh, you know, delicate balancing act between water, nutrient levels, uh, the weather conditions, and the PGR on top of that. And the objective of my you know, entire program is to maintain 50 to 60% suppression without going up into the 80 or 90% suppression, you know, line. Exactly. I, I think that's, um, that's uh, we, we touched on it earlier, was that every situation calls for a specific, I mean, a, a custom, you know, plan. Um, you have, you know, your arsenal, as you could say, of, the, of, uh, of PGRs, you know, um, based on the response you get from Tenex all the way down to like something as strong as pack of bleaches all. Um, it, it just depends on where you are, you know, your climate, your grass type, your cultural practices as Ray touched on. Um, uh, but Bill, I'm interested, um, like the, the, with the growing degree model, like if, if you were just, just, if you could just try to explain it to the average homeowner, for example, you know, what are they looking at? What are they, what's something that they can like try to relate it to, to where they can understand applications how long they last how strong they you know they can control the growth of your grass with something that maybe you can share with them yeah so a growing ingredient model um it sounds complicated i remember the day i invented these models i was a sophomore in college i just read a paper that said as it gets hotter out growth regulators um seem to go away faster and i just learned in my intro agronomy class about these growing degree days something that farmers have used forever to know like when to expect their corn to germinate or weeds uh, and thought, well, we could probably apply the same approach to estimate when a growth regulator needs to be reapplied. So they're pretty simple. It's just, you take the temperature every day and you add them together from the day you last applied a growth regulator. So when it's really hot outside, say you had a bunch of days where the average air temperature is 70 Fahrenheit. So 80 degree highs, 60 degree lows, Wow, we get everything in Celsius for these models. So that's about 20 degrees Celsius. Um, so then we just start adding those days together. So like for Primo Potting Green, we'd say at 200 growing degree days, we just add all the temperatures up. Uh, and then when we hit 200, we need to say, okay, we need to reapply because the PGR level is so low on the plant that if we don't reapply, the plant is going to go out of suppression. 
And that's essentially all this is doing. So if it's cold, and say we're only averaging 50 degrees Fahrenheit, well, that's 10 degrees Celsius. That means it would take us 20 days to hit 200. Um, but for uh, lawn height, or for greens height, or if it's warmer outside, and it's we're doing 20 growing degree days a day, or 70 degrees Fahrenheit average temperature, then it's 10 days. And then if it's really hot, like you know, high of 100, low in the mid 70s, we might be accumulating nearly 30 growing degree days a day. And so we might have to reapply every week to maintain season-long clipping suppression. And so what we've figured out is that people were probably over-applying PGRs in the spring and the fall. And that was causing problems. And then in the summer, they were probably under-applying because they were applying, say, every two weeks. Right. And their intervals might have changed from three to four weeks in the spring and the fall and been less than a week in the middle of the summer. So it just allows someone to kind of visualize your, or estimate how fast the, the product breaks down. It's like, you know, you take an, an, an uh, Tylenol or an ibuprofen or something like that. You know, it says this should last four to six hours because our temperatures in our bodies are always the same, right? 98 degrees. Right. Um, but because reptiles and plants and everything that's cold-blooded like that lives in the atmosphere, when it's cold outside, everything runs a little slower. And so it lasts longer. And when it's real hot outside, all those organisms are going to, you know, a fast rate and they can detoxify that that uh, growth regulator much quicker. So that's really just kind of the gist of, of what's going on there. Right. Um, it, that's that's so funny, the comparison to the Tylenol and, you know, that, you know, into that. Um, it, so I, I, from a personal experience, um, I was I had a uh, it took me a little bit to really grasp. I mean, I, I'm still, you know, learning myself about you know, um, PGRs and the growing degree model, growing degree day model. I, uh, for example, I, I applied, you know, combination of um, Trinpac and Flaprimidol uh, to my lawn. And I went to, uh, I, I think Syngenta has Greencast. They, you know, you can keep, you can keep track of your growing degree days there. They just kind of, you put in your, um, uh, you, right. You, you put it, you put in your, your uh, zip code and then you can choose your, uh, your temperature uh, base. Um, but what happened with me was I was going by the 50 degree Fahrenheit uh, base and that was giving me I, I live like i said i live in southern california and some of my growing degree days are like 40 45 even pushing 50 growing degree days every day and yeah, I, no, I, I, was, I was like i'm sorry yeah, no, that's where i'm always stressing that you know i guess the problem that's one of the things like our greenkeeper app it you know it automatically knows that stuff so it does it for you because so i've coded right. it that way but the other, you know, the, the Greencast models, they work fine, right? I mean, I have no problem with, with using those. Um, it's just that you have to know what your base is. And it's simple for for PGRs. Um, they're always in Celsius. And cool season, they're zero. And warm season, they're 10. Right. Um, and if you get those dialed in right, then you're going to be okay. They say you did 32 Fahrenheit. So, you know, I don't want to even think Celsius. Well, then it means that your growing degree day intervals are going to be 1.8 times uh shorter than they should be uh because the uh the conversion from fahrenheit to celsius is it's like almost what almost one degree uh celsius is really two degrees fahrenheit um the reason i brought that up was because again I, I was keeping track and by the time i was up for my next application it had only been man i don't know just a few like you know eight or nine days and yeah like, well well and in my head i'm like no nah, i shouldn't be under regulation for longer than this i mean really that this is what i heard about you know, and again, like me, myself, I'm a homeowner. I do this as a hobby. You know, a lot, a lot of places of information online, you know, um, all these, you know, universities are doing great studies at UNL, you know, for, for example, to try to help you understand it. But sometimes, you know, you do need that, you know, somebody to hold your hand and walk you through it. So I uh, did some reading myself. And yes, I'm supposed to use a 10 Celsius base. So then when I re recalculated my growing degree days with that, then I started to see, okay, I'm supposed to be under regulation for uh, 16 days. So that sounds like a lot more sense compared to what I was doing before, but because, you know, that information to the average person isn't really out there to under try to understand that. That was just, you know, a mistake on my part. Now I understand. So um, exactly. just, just, just to pretty... make it a thing that, you know, it happens, you know. And that's the thing too. And then like, even just figuring out like what those intervals should be, it's a lot more complex than even the greenkeeper makes it. There's a lot that goes into understanding exactly how these regulators perform. And there's a lot of nuance in there that's really too, maybe probably too deep for this conversation. Um, but just know that there's some flexibility in there. And if you're doing multiple apps, you know, kind of just trust what you're seeing. Uh, trust, trust your clipping yields. Uh, how often, you know, golf courses might measure their clippings. But 
uh, if it's just how often you have to mow and even, you know, that you, you kind of get an idea of what your normal is. And if it starts going real low, well, then maybe we should try shot those, those intervals or dial the rates down or something like that. So, but yeah, it's, and I think that's the thing. It's like, we have a lot to learn there, you know? So that's why I said, you know, I'm actively doing research uh, this summer to help, you know, build better models for Greenkeeper. I know that's one of the things that, you know, we've been reinvesting in that. And it's like, all right, you know, we, we want to uh, build better models for homeowners that are in our site. So, you know, we're hiring people to build all those models this summer. So, you know, we're just constantly trying to, uh, to help figure out some of those things, especially on the lawn side, where honestly the research is, is, is a lot more skimpy than it is on greens and fairways. Uh, Ray, and do you think you want to add to that? Well, I think Bill largely covered it, you know, in terms of the importance of the growing degree days. And uh, believe it or not, I intuitively knew it because I basically track or pay attention to my clipping volume 12 months out of the year. And that was going on long before I started routinely treating with PGRs. You know, I noticed that there are certain times of the year where I get what I call the tidal wave of clippings coming out of the mower. When would that be for you, eh? What time, like, when, what, what kind of time of year, what kind of climate is, is like it during that time of the year? Okay, time of the year when I deal with that or can be dealing with that is anywhere from mid-April all the way up until November. Okay. And here's my, here's my daytime highs, low 90s, but nighttime does not go below... 75. Yeah. Perfect weather for mineralization there. I, we, that's what we're dealing with here now in, in Nebraska. You know, we get highs in the 90s and lows in around 70. The, you know, by August, it'll be mid-70. And then we see the grass just bolts out of the ground, add some moisture to it, and, you know, away it goes. So, yeah, that's when I get more aggressive with my PGRs. It's just, you know, let, let my mower tell me what I need to be doing and, View it like a tool. I, I try to think about it like a, a brake pedal. Uh, yes. You know, depending on how hard you push that brake is, is going to help you, you know, get hit your goal speed um, or growth rate in this case. So, yeah. And in my case, I deal with turf grasses that, contrary to them reacting to hot days and hot nights by slowing down, instead, I have turf grasses that the hotter it is, the faster they grow. You know, I, that's that's where I have to then also think about that and really be watching my weather. And when it cools off, I need to pull back on the more prolonged acting PGRs because uh, with something like Trinexapac and a new, those last long enough for me from, you know, say December through March, such that. I don't need or want a very prolonged PGR during that time because I don't think I get my 250 to 300 growing degree days in less than about say, 30 days. And that is on top of the fact that the grass is naturally suppressed due to the daytime and nighttime temperatures being far outside of their ideal temperature. Yep. Um, gentlemen, I, I wanted to carry on into the uh, a short Q and A for our audience. If any of them have a question, um, I wanted to give Spen first dibs here on a question. Maybe he would have for Bill or Green Dog. But before I, we go there, um, I had a viewer here that doesn't have the ability to speak, but he asked if PGRs. If there's any safety concerns with kids playing in the yard when using a PGR? Okay. Uh, maybe Ray, you can probably better. Okay. We in in many cases. Uh... Because the PGR specifically affects gibberellin synthesis and metabolism in the grass, in most cases, that does not interact with the biological you know, systems within a human or most animals. So I would have little to no safety concerns about you know, children playing in the lawn provided the spray has dried on the grass completely because in many cases for a lot of our 
product formulations, the actual material of concern in that product formulation is not the active ingredient itself. It is the solvent used to formulate the product that is way more toxic than the actual product itself. Okay. So just make sure it's uh, dried. And um, if if it's something like plupermidol, make sure it's watered in well before... Yes, 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 absolutely. I mean, if a product calls for watering in... And oh, by the way, folks, that is the exact reason why paclobutrazole is officially not registered for residential turf. It is because the EPA has decided that uh, in, a, in a lawn care setting, applicators will not be good stewards of the product. Uh, they will do what I call throw and go. They'll throw down the product and stick their flag in the lawn and drive away. Okay. Uh, spin. Anything? Uh, any questions? Want to? Anything, yeah, uh, yeah. I've got, I've got a couple things. Uh, Bill, thank you very much for uh, for being on the talk turf talk show, and I uh, really appreciate your input. And Green Doc, I really appreciate you coming up and doing this all the way from Hawaii. But uh, in my profession, I never used a plant growth regulator. Okay, so I was always scared of the repair ability of the turf after a football game. How quickly would it repair itself? And so I never used it. I never used pre-emergent on my sports fields or anything like that because I don't want any root printers or anything like that. So I was very leery of it. But when I got to talking to Travis Hogan with the Kansas City Chiefs, he plays around with PGRs like no one's business. So he's got it down to a science, and he uses it totally different from what it's labeled for. He uses to build structure of a plant and to make it so thick it doesn't divot. So he's got it down to a science, which he learned on the PGA. Uh, I forgot the golf course he worked at, but it's a real famous golf course uh, where he learned all this. And then he applied it to the NFL field for all the practice fields and the game field. And if you watch the Kansas City Chiefs, you won't see a divot. It is so thick. And what he does, he's got his rates down on, I don't know if it's the PGR tab on our main page or the Travis Hogan page. Gee, I don't know if you've seen that, but he's putting out like two ounces per acre every week. And sometimes he'll bump it up to three ounces an acre. And he is really making this field really tight and, and strong. And so he he has no divots whatsoever. So he's playing it the other way. And I don't, you know, I don't know how I know it's working great for him. I mean, it, it was voted best field in the NFL from the last couple of years, but he's taking this product and doing something totally different with it. So I don't know if the GDD scale would work for him. It might, but uh, he's going at a low dose, and whatever he's doing is working. I don't know, Bill, if you've heard of people doing that or not. Yeah, we, we see this a lot in golf turf uh, on greens. Uh, they'll take a two-ounce rate of Primo per acre. And uh, and for anyone doing, you know, per thousand, that would be about 0 0.04 fluid ounces per thousand. Uh, and so they'll go out and but then the interval you know he he's got spin is he got a is he a bermuda field is he managing yeah. bermuda? so he's, he's got north bridge okay so yeah he's he's north bridge that's right uh, i was thinking about the uh the soccer field i think is a blue blue muta setup yeah. Yeah, uh north bridge so what we're finding uh and we're doing a lot of research in this right now working with the jim brazen at tennessee uh on fairways and uh so it'd be very similar to type of scenario but we're finding on greens that these guys are on these like two ounce per acre intervals every two every week, but that the growing green day intervals are a lot longer. So even though the, the rate starts low, like he starts there, as he starts ramping it up, it starts to actually leads to the kind of a stacking going on. And so it's probably moving to an equivalent rate of, you know, four to six ounces uh or even more if you're on that tighter interval. I mean, KC is hot, so I'm sure they're still burning through plenty of, of PGR uh, in that environment. But, you know, we found for Ultra Dwarf Greens, and I don't think the fairways are going to be much different, honestly, than the greens, unlike the bent grasses, that the interval is probably closer to like 10 to 14 days. So that means that if you're applying twice as frequently as you should be, that essentially doubles your, your uh, application rate. So at least probably, if you took a GDD approach, would probably be somewhere around that four ounce rate, um, just on how that program works. So 
But okay. I, I don't think it's causing any problems. If you see any results that you want, then like, you know, it's simple, it's easy, it's calendar based. Um, and then, you know, that's, that's, that still can be a really great successful program. Yeah. Okay. He's doing great things with it. Oh yeah, exactly. I have, I have something to add to that in that, uh, in talking to one of my friends, uh, you know, Frank, if you're up in heaven, uh, you know, listening to this, I got warned about PGRs actually making the the turf get overly thick and thatchy. And my understanding of that is when a PGR, like, say, Trinexapac works, what it's doing is... It's slowing down the vertical growth, but that energy to grow in something like, say, Bermuda has to go somewhere. So guess where it goes? That energy to grow gets redirected into the roots, the rhizomes, and the stolons. And when you combine that with a very aggressive nutrient program, I could see somebody applying light rates of PGR frequently and, you know, feeding it its nutrients, basically getting that turf to knit together extremely tightly. Then I can see it happening. Yeah, that's that's exactly what's happening. It turns Northbridge into something totally different. I mean, it doesn't even look like Northbridge. It's been on, on a conversation on one of the other um, channels here in the, in the in the server. I remember you said something about having that thatch uh, for footing, how that's an advantage in uh, in some cases. Yeah, I mean, it, with all the hybrid that's coming out that, that Dr. Wu's been putting out, you know, you got the North Bridge, you got the Latitude, and now you got the Tahoma, and there's going to be a new one called the Iron Cutter that's supposed to be fantastic. Those are naturally thatch aggressive. Every year you need to coro it, you need to phrase mow it, you need to verticut. But the other older turf, you know, like 419, Tiff Sports, uh, Patriot, and stuff like that, they, they don't build that much thatch. But in football, you need a layer of thatch. Most people are building football fields now with sand base, you know, sand from a sod farm that's grown on plastic. That's great. If they, if that's great for one game like the Super Bowl. That's what they do. But if you have multiple games, you need that thatch layer there to, so they won't rip your, you know, they won't take the farm away from you when they rip and dip it. So your there's thatch, more meat on there, right? There's more meat on there. The footing's the same. Everything's the same. Uh, to me, there's a little bit more better traction. But once they get down to that soil and rip that divot out, then you got a long time before it bounces back, and you're you're putting in ryegrass in that area. So yeah, that's what I like the thatch. I have another question here. Uh, this one's for uh, Bill from one of our listeners, Brandon Folk. Blue Muta, you touched on Blue Muta here in a sec. Or actually, you just brought it up, actually. It was, you didn't really touch on it. But a growing degree day for something like Blue Muta, does that get increasingly complicated because it's, you know, mixed oh, yeah. season? Oh, yeah. Blue Muta, Blue Muta itself is incredibly complicated, in my opinion. But uh, right. <laughs> just a, everything about it's tough. Are you managing most grass or anything? And it would be tough, I, I think. You kind of look at which grass is the one that's more actively growing, but and then you know the thing too is the low mo blues themselves they are inherently difficult to understand what's going on with PGRs. Low mo blues inherently don't really grow, and so they don't really they naturally don't make gibberellin. So if you're trying to block a hormone to make it grow slower, uh, but the plant isn't even making that hormone, well, you get some weird responses. So sometimes even with like cutlass in our research trials, we've seen it's like several years in a row. So we know it's not just some fluke one year thing. You put cutlass down, the grass actually grows faster. Like it doesn't even make any sense. You put a growth regulator down and you make it grow faster. We think it's probably some biochemistry feedback. Like maybe the plant actually turns on the pathway in response to it. Possibly it's a theory, but um, the, the ultra ultra dwarf blues that really grow slow, those real true low numbers that just, don't want to grow above you know, an inch. Um, their whole PGR response in general is still a little mysterious. We've done it on athletic field height, fairway height, uh, and we still get these really strange responses out of them. You can't really do them at long height because they just kind of stop growing at long height. So uh, those are, you know, these some of those new grasses are really tough to understand what the PGR is doing. Yeah, that's really interesting how um, you brought up how they grow faster or, you know, may react in a certain way or have a different response. Yeah, I, um, there's, you know, there's uh, some people that I see on a couple forums and 
places on the internet where people are experimenting with their own blue muta plot, like you know, in in a residential setting. And some of the challenges they face are like, you know, like what do you do? You hit a dead end. You know, for example, for weed control, you know, if you have something like goosegrass, I mean, the, Ray actually has a interesting take on it. Ray, you want you want to touch on that for like you know weed control in the uh, blue muta? That gets very tricky in blue muta because. I know about what's, for example, safe for Bermuda, and I also know what's safe for bluegrass, and unfortunately, there is no meeting in the middle when you have Bermuda, because with Bermuda, the only thing I could offer for that is you are forced to have a very heavy-duty pre-emergent program that probably includes, like, Ronstar, Prodiamine, and uh, Benzolide, you know, all in the same year. It almost, you, it almost comes down to you know, picking one. Like, which one do you want to look better than the other? Yeah, which one do you want to look better? And I, I even face the same issue when people tell me that here's a half acre or a quarter acre of lawn on my property and... I've got so many different grasses in it, and you know what? I tell them, okay, you got to choose one because I can make one out of these look like golf fairway, but if you have them growing all together, nobody and nothing is going to look good at any time. It'll all look bad all the time. So you got to pick one. <laughs> An anomaly, right? It's Yeah, just yeah. trying to make those work. I mean, it's like... See some that seem like are doing well, and I mean I don't know a whole lot about Blue Meter, but thank you, Bill, for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yes, yeah, no problem. You, yeah, I know sometimes I get a little bit busy with uh, different stuff, so it's hard to keep track of all the different social media and ways to communicate with people. But I was free, and I figured I would come and say hey. So thank you for doing that, thank you, Bill. <laughs> thank yeah, thanks for sharing this day. Yeah, I appreciate it, Ray. No, I didn't mean to crash your. <laughs> You hardly, hardly, you, you hardly crashed. You contributed so much to this conversation. I mean, you, you know, you're, you're an asset, truly an asset. <laughs> I had a question. Um, so I've never used PGR and I'm up here in Minnesota. I know Ray, you had mentioned, uh, TNX and new for pool season and everybody's situation is different. Is there a thing where, I should be looking at, let's say, my upcoming weather and what those growing degree days are and figuring out um, like what um, what PGR would work best for those for my upcoming growing degree days and then also for like cutting down to roughly one mowing a week. Okay, here's what I'd actually suggest. I, I don't also look at growing degree days. I also look at what effect your upcoming weather conditions is having on the grass. And I'd imagine that in Minnesota, when it gets too hot for the warm season grass, you get some kind of a slowdown as well. So you need to kind of have your finger on that pulse as well and think about whatever you do, it's probably wise to not overregulate at a time when the grass is suffering from hot weather stress. Yeah, so... I know that's that's exactly been part of my hesitation is, you know, the, you go through the crazy mowing of the spring and then you start running into the summer heat. And if you get the PGR down too late, then I'm going regulated into summer stress mm -hmm. um, when it's already slowing down. And then you're mowing less than once a week sometimes then and just don't want to run into more problems, I guess. What kind of tell me more about your 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 situation as a kid that grew up in Milwaukee that's lived in upstate New York and now lives in Nebraska. I'm pretty hey, familiar uh... with our gross rates. You know, one of the things that we see with cool season lawns in the center part of the country is you get this really rapid growth rate in the spring uh, once the soils hit about 50 degrees for about a week straight, especially if there's moisture there. And then you're baling hay, right? And so that's why we say don't fertilize that time of year because extra fertilizer actually burns sugars that are going to help you with heat stress. So that's when you start to turn your growth regular program on. You can be a little bit more aggressive with the rates. Then we see this natural slowdown uh, across the whole region, including grasses, through late May to mid-June. 
It's normal. I think it's something to do with the plant trying, trying to make, normally make seed heads, but we mow it so you don't see it. Those are the times you're going to be careful with your PGRs. That's when you go a little bit lower. Then when you get the other side of the summer solstice, the humidity comes up, the corn's higher, you know, it's a lot warmer. All of a sudden now the grass starts to really grow aggressively. And we see some of our fastest growth rates on cool season lawns in that this region in July. So you can actually then start to become a little bit more aggressive as long as you see consistent heat and moisture in the forecast. And then once things start to slow down in September, those cool nights and shorter days, that plant immediately starts prepping for the winter. That's when you start backing your rates lower and lower and lower uh, and stay in your intervals with the growing degree days. Remember, the growing degree days are how long the products last. The rate is how much suppression you get. So that would be the approach I would take. I would kind of ramp it up with the growth rate in the spring. I'd go to kind of a middle rate in June, kind of feel how it's doing. And then if it starts to grow a lot in July, especially if it's an older lawn with good soil, you'll see a big growth. If you're at a new lawn with bad soil, you know, a country, you know built on crappy uh, clay that the contractor stripped away all the good soil, then it's a scenario in which you'd want to actually fertilize in July. You can do it with an organic fertilizer. You can do it with any kind of fertilizer, just, you know, watered in to help minimize burn. Uh, and that's going to really help your lawn be healthy through that summer stretch. Could you speak to the difference between the various PGRs as how they react on, you know, a cool season grass growing in the Midwest? Because I, I'm extremely familiar with how warm season grasses react to the uh, individual PGRs, but uh, I'm not that familiar with the uh, how they act individually on, uh, on, say, a cool season grass growing in the Midwest. It again comes back to what the label rate is. Any of the PGRs can have minimum problems or a lot of problems. I would say by far Paclo is the most sensitive for a lot of our lawn high grasses where we can see a solid month of suppression out of that active ingredient. The Cutlass Anew and Primo, I think it's really rate dependent, honestly. And most of the labels are going to get you somewhere around 50% suppression. That's kind of the goal that people have gone towards. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Somewhere around there, I think Primo and Anu probably lasts about the same, maybe a little longer on the Anu, possibly. The Anu might be a little harder on the bluegrasses than the Primo. Uh, and then the Cutlass is that wild card, where sometimes we see not much suppression, sometimes we see some suppression, other times we see growth enhancement. So that one has really been a wild card for us in, in our, you know, honestly, 12 years. Of, I've been looking at Cutlass for 10 of those 12 years, and to me, that one's still a hard one to, to get a grasp on. I think there's a lot of differences there, uh, depending on a lot of different variables. Well, the, and the, the, I'm, the reason why I ask is because I see differentials in response uh, between cutlass and zoysia grass, cutlass and Bermuda, uh, cutlass and seashore pespalum. I mean, I deal with some seashore pespalum, and even cutlass on something like St. Augustine, where there's a differential in how the grass reacts. I, I also seem, see the same differentials when dealing with a new and even Trinexapac, where overall, though, in a warm season grass, what I note a new for is the fact that in a warm season grass, regulation from it comes on very quickly, but at the same time, it is not locked down at like 80 or 90 percent suppression like how a high rate of trinexapac can do it and at the same time it then comes back out of regulation within 14 days and there's very little rebound effect after it does come out of that regulation from the anew it's 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 an interesting product you know for sure um, uh, Bill, I know you said you had to go, but you have time for one more question here, and then uh, we can wrap this up. I'll do a real short one, yeah. Okay, um, just uh, one more here from LW50 in the audience. Um, the secondary effects, um, maybe both positive and negative, on with PGRs, like you know, as far as like turf density, or um, you know, dealing with when you're going to have to fertilize a bird cutting, the growth, the color, anything that uh, may be concerning to homework. Um, I think it, it still comes comes back to just having some level of healthy growth rate. And um, if you really, sh you can shut things down. You won't have to mow it. 
I mean, and it's going to look bad and it's going to be stressed out. If you can keep some growth rate in there where maybe you're mowing, maybe if it's a low maintenance lawn that you not have much traffic on, you're not over mowing, you might be able to stretch it to like, you know, mowing every 10 days and it doesn't grow much and it might look great. It just depends on how much traffic you're going to have, the environmental stress that there is right now. The thing I do know is it takes multiple applications uh, to see the benefits. So in, even for my first set of research doing this in 2007, it took you know several weeks, several reapplications to really elicit a real change in the density uh, and sustaining rooting, plant health, you know, reduce all the, the myriad of papers that have been out there to talk about different plant health benefits. But it all takes time. So the most important thing we can do is try to maintain some level of suppression with some combination of a growth rate leader, whatever you're comfortable with. And then you'll generally see a lot of the plant health benefits. And the plant health benefits are generally greater for your class A PGRs, your Primo Max, and your new type um, ingredients. So I think that's, if you're thinking plant health, you know, moderation is key here and you're going to get the plant health. If you want suppression, well, you can do that, but you're not going to get the plant health benefits that you might want. So lower rates um, of the PGRs can go wonders to make that plant healthier. Yeah, I've got a question. Where does someone go to find out how long an app is supposed to last? So, you know, like when I poop down my Teenex, how many days do I have to calculate? 200 days and then go to the DVD? I don't know where to find where to have, uh, those uh, answers for me, you know, not not depending on how many ounces I go per acre, but how many days <laughs> will it last? How many days, how many days of control you're asking, right? Growing degree days. Yeah, so then you could put it in the GDD and say, okay, I'm going to get 200 days. Okay, so once I hit 200 days on the GDD scale, I need to reapply. Where do you get that figure at to know how long your product's going to last or how many GDD days you get out of that one app? No, I mean, we've, so in Greenkeeper, we have 700 different PGR models. And essentially when you put down the rate you want to use, it tells you how many growing degree days we recommend and approximately what the average amount of peak suppression will be. So if you get in there, like say it says 200 and growing degree days for, for it, then, you know, that's what it would be. And some products you're going to find out like on putting greens for a new and primo, doesn't matter what the rate you you put in. We don't see much of a response uh, there, so it's just always two hundred or two hundred and five uh, for Primo. I think I knew it was like two fifty, um, and I don't even memorize them all because every time then you put in different rates, it changes a little bit. So like pack low on a fairway or athletic field height, and you know, well, have a huge difference on how long it lasts. So the models run through the calculations based on the rates, and then they spit out what that interval should be. I mean, that's helpful. Okay. That's an important figure you need, right? Yeah, and actually, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to get people away from, actually, is growing degree day intervals in general. Uh, yeah, I've been pre preaching them for 12 years, but what we're going to show in Greenkeeper now is, uh, is, is like a, a forecast of what your projected growth rate will, suppression will be for 10 days. And then when you go in there, you'll pick the active ingredient, and then you can manipulate the rate to then see what that next 10 days is going to look like. And so then you, you know, it's, it's getting away from, well, I got to reapply this day and then I'm going to apply like in 13 days and then in seven days and then whatever the weather's doing, you could apply every week, but then you might be actually manipulating your rates to try to simulate it. So it's kind of like a flipped over backwards version. So that's the real geeky version of how to do it, but you could take the same approach, right? Like if you know, growing degree days tell you when to reapply, you could just apply a lower rate if you said wanted to apply every week like they're doing that for the, the Chiefs, yep. uh, still then have me rely on the application you made before, right? So there's some flexibility in there um, into trying to really get this dialed in. That would be the way to do it. So I have my, you know, I got three full-time computer science developers and that's that's what they build this stuff for me because I can't do it. We have 40 degrees in, in this stuff. So that's, that's how I want people thinking is like, okay, well, what do I need for the next 10 days? And then pick a rate that fits that best. Yep. Okay. Uh, totally, totally get it. Anyways, well, I'm going to run. Thanks, everyone, for having Thank you. me. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. <laughs> yep. See ya. Have a good one. Um, Ray, um, it, something like, uh, for example, I, I use Edgeless, which is also uh, Legacy. It's the same formulation, right? Spin happens mm -hmm. to have, um, he just got himself some Legacy that he's starting to use. I, I understand that, you know, rule of thumb for that can be 300 to 350 growing degree days on 
an application of leg of label right legacy. Is that correct? Yes, correct, correct. Um, and, I, 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 go ahead. And that, in actual practice, I I look at it too in terms of the higher your rate, the longer it lasts as well. Because uh, when you get into extremely high rates of fluoroprimidol, remember that three to six weeks of actual suppression because legacy in its original labeling guess what that was intended for that was actually intended to be used on bent grass greens as a pgr and poa annua control so the intention for for legacy was for them to apply like four to eight ounces of legacy you know on a 250 degree growing degree day model on a, on a bent green. So when you translate that over to a warm season grass growing in a hot climate, then you'll find that your rates need to be higher in order to get both the duration and the degree of growth regulation that you desire. But once you get there, you're then looking at it's at 350 plus as far as your growing degree days. And it's very important to not reapply too soon because with fluoroprimidol, you have that soil uptake effect where if you apply too soon, you're basically doing the equivalent of stacking or doubling your application rate above and beyond what you intend. And does that better help explain legacy? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't, not too many people in the lawn, you know, industry or residential is going to be using legacy. That stuff's expensive. <laughs> it sure is. Uh, um, as, as a matter of fact, Ben, um, so th there's another product on the, on the market available to, uh, you know, as a label for residential is um, uh, it's called Edgeless. And it's literally the same exact formulation of legacy in an eight ounce bottle. And that goes for ninety to hundred dollars, depending on where you buy it. So uh, that's that's a lot of us. That, that that was my introduction into into PGR. That's I felt like it was the best use for me, and that's what I went with. Now, you know, for a homeowner to go and buy a gallon of Legacy, yeah, I don't think uh, that's the most practical thing to do, or Cutlass or something. Like Fifteen hundred bucks. I mean, I, yeah. just, I was like, holy cow! But you know, it, it's it's Primo with with Cutlass, right? So I yeah. use TNX. I use TNX on all my common grounds. But uh, Jeremy Treadwell at uh, Indiana, Indiana University is using Legacy on his Tahoma, and man, is that field looking like really tight? I mean, it's he's bought at a quarter of an inch. It's unbelievable what he's doing with that stuff, and he's he's telling me he's spraying every ten days at fifteen wow. ounce, fifteen ounce per acre rate. So he's going through a bottle like you know every month. Yeah, I mean, it's so I use TNX and I still don't know the days it covers for TNX at the full rate. I only go nine ounces per acre on, a, on the TNX, you know, and I'm still trying to figure out how many days I'm going to get out of the TNX. And it also <laughs> depends on the nitrogen rate that you couple with it because, you know, again, this is like a balancing act between. Yeah amount yeah. of regulation and how much nitrogen you're pushing in my case i tend to keep turf areas on rather low nitrogen to begin with i keep it low because for two reasons number one i don't want the surge growth number two i still remember what my friend told me about if you get the pgr wrong you get thatch. And what he was referring to was if somebody were to push the end rate on their green or fairway height turf and then do PGR on top of that, they then get led into a false sense of security that they're, they're not mowing ver as much as they would have to with that excess of nitrogen. But what's happening below the green grass is actually a problem because then that's buildup of roots, stolons, and rhizomes. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is your actual thatch. That is to be differentiated from oh, seeing a layer of grass clippings on top of the lawn. That's not yeah. thatch. Right. Thatch is the tangle of stolons, roots, and rhizomes underneath the green part of the grass. 
Right. Um, a, a gentlemen, uh, I think we should wrap it up here. Ray, thank you very much for joining us today and helping us explain. Yes. Or get a better understanding of this. Um, I think uh, I think everyone would agree. I think Bill was a very pleasant surprise to have him and come in here and and share on his uh, you know educational side or the research end of the uh, of the plant growth regulators and the GDDs going on. Uh, Spin, anything you want to add before we wrap it up? No, no. I mean, I was glad to see Bill come on and and uh, thank you guys for getting us together and, and getting it out here. Yeah, Pretty cool. good. Answer. Um, it, yeah, I agree. Not sure if we have anyone else coming up for another talk, but um, it may be down the road. Uh, Ray can come in and uh, do another one of these, maybe you know next month or something. See if I'd be up for it. Yeah, I'd be I'd be up for it. Uh, you know, anytime. Just uh, you know, let me know because uh, you know this is just uh, part of what I do is you know just basically educating people. Steward of the industry. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Ray, you're a walking encyclopedia. I'll tell you what. <laughs> You know, all yeah, the names, I agree. you're throwing out all these chemical names and it's just over my head. Just say Teen X, Legacy, <laughs> Primo, and I get that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, well I, I, the unfortunate thing is, is that I've managed to be able to use most of these products with the exception of Paclo because Paclo just doesn't fit into a lot of what I do. And for another reason in that, Paclobutrazole, or you know, trim it tends to overregulate warm season turf. That much I know about it. It just overregulates it. It's it's too much for Bermuda. It's just too All right, much. gentlemen. Again, thank you <laughs> nice for uh, our time. Uh, everyone in the audience, appreciate you guys joining us. Uh, Y'all have a good day. <laughs> yeah.